Now would be a good time to turn off your cell phone, quiet your beeping watch, remove your iPod earbuds, put down your digital camera, log off your laptop, unplug your Xbox and PlayStation, take your fingers off Blackberry keys, extinguish the HD TV, Watch the white egret stalking across the lawn. Listen to your breaths. Examine your eye colors in a mirror. Savor a dried cranberry. Clasp a child's hand in both of yours. Smell your lover's neck where hair tapers to skin. Say, I love you. I'm not sure what frightens you. I only write about my life and this cancer, which for me is neither morbid nor depressing. It helps me get on, enjoy each moment. I spend my days in peace with horses and dogs. I clean stalls, work outside in for community, home, there's lunch with my children, dinner with my wife, playtime with my grandchildren. I sit silent in the woods on the back of a horse, watch pastures green up, new plants push through winter soil. Writing shows me who I am, where I am, where I was, where I'm going. If anything, I'm saner now than ever, enjoying the whole timeline of my life. Taking stock. Just cut hay will arrive at dusk. I look at the uneven pile of sun bleached brown bales left over from past years. Each has its own character leafy legume, wispy thin grass coarse with tough yellow stems. Tan outsides hide muted green within. The bottom layer smells faintly of mold where it meets concrete. I move 50 pound bundles by their red and tan twine, willy nilly at first, fumbling for a plan. I find mounds of loose hay, nests my dogs built in winter, to sleep away gray daylight hours. There's part of an old glove, just the red lining, that disappeared one cold day Minnie was bored. I come back about sunset. Fifty feet away, I can smell the thick scent of alfalfa and timothy 
that was still connected to the earth four days ago. I inhale the fragrance that will fade along with the grass green facade, like a collection of memories covered by the dust of time till you dig deep into the stack. Remnants. My house is missing. The safe in-between house between infancy and before high school. It was brick, painted white, two-story with a greenhouse by its side. Brick path gardens my parents built lay in the rear. A log cabin playhouse sat in snowball bushes nearby. Its four acres seemed unending to a child of six romping with Great Danes. I hid and played, gathered fruit in the North 40, the name my father gave to the apple orchard. Asparagus grew in beds dad had dug while I watched. A tire swing hung from a hundred-year-old white oak. My house is missing. The greenhouse with its snapdragons and scented air is gone. Old trees are fresh cut stumps. Everything is off kilter, like the shattered lights atop the old gate pillars. The stone bridge across the creek leads nowhere. Dressed in pajamas with feet, I padded across my bedroom on the second floor of the white clabbered house, looked out the window, over the creek, into the woods, and last night's snowfall on the branches. I had a new Western Union radio telegraph signal set. The two blue units, connected by thin wires, lit, clicked, buzzed with each keystroke. My sister was asleep. I put one unit on the floor near her, the other as far away as possible, sat down cross-legged. I pressed the key. Nothing happened. Dead batteries. I took them out, connected exposed tips of wire directly to the sets, and put the other ends one at a time, into an outlet on the blue painted baseboard. Grainy seeds. Everything shook and rattled in my school in the spring of 52 under the flight path of Lambert St. Louis Airport. I was 11, part of the school's 5% Jewish quota. Times called for careful assimilation. I went to Jewish Sunday school every week, but it was at this nearly non-Jewish school I watched a black and white Holocaust documentary in the dark, alone, I saw pictures of souls taking flight. My innocence rose into the sky, rattling more than windows.
lagging silver dollars, mom's dad. Each week when I came to their apartment, my grandfather flattened the brim of his fedora, placed it on his bed. The two of us stood in a doorway, almost touching, holding six silver dollars each. He raised his hand, paused, pitched. With a gentle arc, it found its home. When it was my turn to try, his warm hands guided me. I'm the grandfather now. We will use a baseball cap and those same coins. We will stand in the doorway, the two of us, lagging silver dollars. Not good for the blood. Talking and kissing on her blue couch in the 1950s, late enough we heard her mother's knock on the wall above. <laughs> Staying any longer would be nicht good for the bluten. Friday evenings at her house brought brisket, kasha, and bow ties. Afterwards, a movie, party, staying in to talk, but always ending with us on the couch till we heard the knock. Great-grandchildren now gamble around all of us as we sit on the same couch. We laugh, remember when staying longer was nicht good for the bluten. <laughs> La cuenta, por favor. Only bits of egg white from the merluza a la rusa on my plate, crumbs of Cuban bread scattered on the linen, empty sangria pitcher, wood spoon stained red. I wave the waiter to bring me the check. Give the bill to your father. It's my treat. We always take you out to dinner. Tonight it's my treat. Maurice, tell him to give you the check. Thanks. <laughs> Gumbo Flats 2, The Pink Lincoln. In the 80s, his 70s, my 40s, I drew south to fly him, excuse me, I flew south to drive him north. His pale yellow Cadillac was waiting full of luggage. On the interstate, I set the cruise control. We settled in to chat away the miles. Talk turned to my teenagers and driving. In detail, with as many gestures as allowed at the wheel, I told of times when, as their passenger, I braked involuntarily. I wondered aloud if a parent ever gets over that. No, he replied. <laughs> Not even now? Not even now. OK. Did you know that I used to drive your pink Lincoln at high speed down the three-lane highway through Gumbo Flats. He had known, but never said a word. Locked in, just above the speed limit, we rode for a while in silence, comfortable in our lemon leather seats. Fox is right over there. A man with a baby on his back, the mother next to him, 
points into the woods, but it's too far downhill and off the trail for me to see. And I am glad. I knew there'd be a fox here today since I started my ride. I'm not surprised, but go no closer. The last foxes I saw here were small gray vixens that presaged death. It's very quiet today. No breeze to rustle the last few leaves that cling to the trees. Even the fall blanket on the trail is soundless under my mare's hooves. We pass a new straw cowboy hat nestled in oak leaves in the center of the path. Beyond, a maple sheds its helicopter seeds that spiral to the ground in a tight formation, like a military expeditionary force. A girl on a quarter horse approaches from the other direction. Did you lose your hat, I ask? There's one back there. She had not. At an abandoned stable, we tread down its center aisle. I imagine it full, redolent, horses snuffling. But nothing's there, just cobwebs and open stall doors. Clutching plastic horses, four years old. I hide on the balcony out in my room. Hope I will not be found. In my hands, held tight to my breast, are my dearest possessions, two small plastic horses, one red, one black. I had misbehaved. My tiny horses were to be taken away for what seemed forever. Sixty years old, I gaze out my window as the horses graze, one chestnut, one black. My memory hangs on to those tiny plastic horses, symbols of what is most dear to me now, the people I love. Some have already been taken away forever. I want to hide again, clutch those precious to my breast, hope. They will never be found. Accessory to the second. I have dad's name, but with the next generation appendage. He's been dead for 16 years. The attachment is still there, confusing computer databases, where my last name often becomes Junior. Being Jewish, I was not supposed to be named after anyone living anyway. Years ago, an Orthodox rabbi asked my Hebrew name. Not thinking, I replied, Moses, son of Moses, Moshe ben Moshe. Confused, the rabbi concluded my father had died before I was born. They called dad by his first name. I'm still known by a diminutive, buddy, implying I'm little, even though over 60. Yet, I don't want to be labeled exactly like him. I'll keep the marker that leaves me attached, but separate. 
I will honor him as he did me, my identity tied to him in wondrous ways beyond genes. Net, you startle awake, mouth my name, grasp my hand, return to another reality. Bit by bit, you lean away, a tree undermined by a sinkhole. As your roots lose their grip, we try to slow your fall. Finally, we stop struggling, hope only to blunt your wide-eyed fright as you gasp for air. We sit at your bedside, listen to every breath, sing holy prayers to your soul until it hears. was in the park on a sunny day. There you were, sitting on a bench. You looked well and happy, though I knew you were dead. We smiled and talked. I asked your advice. But before you answered, I awoke in a dark room without you. two-thirds and gaining. Married 40 of my 60 years, she was my girlfriend, fiance, then wife. We were children in adult clothing, teenagers in a different time. What trust our parents had in us. How naive our belief in one another. So many of our age are no longer together, and there have been times we could have let go. We know it has not been easy to get here. We share children, grandchildren. We share our bodies, minds, possessions. So many memories are ours alone. She is more than wife. She is familiar to me in ways no one else could be. She is my dreams, my center, my family. Drive time. Get off at the next exit. Oh, yeah. Do you know where you're going? Sure. <laughs> Why are you taking this route? I'll take any route you want me to. <laughs> Traffic is stopped. Turn here. But it's longer. At least we'll be moving, not standing still. Fine. Don't forget to take the shears home. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Edified. I sit in the high-backed carved chair the Torah is heavy, and its spindles dig into my legs. I hug it to me, its cover against my body and face. Cloth soft from generations' hands, rich colors now muted. It smells of 
wool, wood, parchment, time. I rise to my feet, hand it to the bar mitzvah, help him as he struggles to lift tradition into the ark. Dust dark red. Men in hoods sandblast the pool. Blue green dust clings to the trees. The wind shivers it into the air to settle on deck, pool, lounges, flowers, bushes, mulch. Jerry died yesterday the second person from our high school class to die this year. We were only 42 students. He was only 63. Jim was cancer free for 10 years. Now it flourishes in all his bones. He is weak from pain, chemistry. It's the same cancer I've escaped for 34 months. Our grandchildren visit for the weekend. I play chess and poker with a five-year-old, climb on jungle gyms in the park, eat dinner with them, their great-grandmother. The next morning, I pick sour cherries, clean and chop them. Dark red juices flow. I make jam, watch errant pits rise bubbling pot. Roots and paths. Jonquils bloom in my manicured mulched yard. Nearby, the woods still exhale winter, bare and brown in the morning sun, nothing green but moss, leftover sprigs of grass, the living and the dead still one. Leafless vines surround us. Some hold half-fallen trees in a tangled aerial embrace. Others wait like snares overhead. Everywhere, scattered, splattered, peeled, broken trees cause us to veer from the familiar track. And upturned trunks, vestigial roots spread like a large pelvic bone. And others are hind feet ready to spring toward us. A chainsawed hollow log is a cannon's bore aimed our way. When I look down the hill, I see the path where I will be heading in the opposite direction on a different plane. I look up, see a hint of where I have been. Both are familiar and strange. A fallen tree caught in the fork of another becomes my rudder. Steelville Ride. The creek looked a bit deep and swift. My mare eased into the water. The gravel bottom gave way. We were swept downstream. Her nose barely reached above the water. I slid off, held tight to her reins. 
We flew down the flooded creek, up to our necks, pitched at the whim of the current. Everything moved very fast, very slow. Time to do nothing but breathe. Then we stopped, pushed into an eddy near the bank. I scrambled up, pulled her to me like towing a boat to shore. The only way out was up a steep slope over rocks and through trees to a familiar farm road. Drained more quickly than my waterlogged clothes, I could barely crawl onto the bear's back. By the time we reached the top, I was frozen in the saddle. We walked an hour to my house, a warm fire. This was both half my life ago and now. I've been knocked off my feet by another rushing current. Even though my toes can touch bottom again, still I am shaking, wet and cold. Pins and needles. As my PSA rises, pushes into the red, I feel like the subject of a twisted David Letterman list. Ten minute visit with the surgeon. Nine steps to prepare for eight needle biopsies, then seven days before results. Six pills to take. Five minutes to extract the samples just four days from now. 3 a.m. I awake thinking two results are possible. One beyond imagination. Looking away, five weeks to think, feel, prepare for what's coming. Betrayed by my unchanged appearance, there's nothing I can sense about the cancer inside. Sitting high in the Tetons, I see the Snake River winding through the valley below. Too far away to hear or see rocks or fallen trees that disturb its current. Hours pass with only the outward view in mind, the other reality tucked away. light. My two-year-old grandson runs around the table. With a smile, his dad says, stop. The boy yells back, no stop, go. Keeps running in glee round and round the table. I look at my cancer, get a lesson in body mechanics. What causes what to stop, go. Rise, flow. Now it's so automatic. Brain desires, body functions. But that may all change. At 60, June Allison's ads take on new meaning. At 60, flows that started at puberty will cease. At 60, I yell back, no stop, go.
unknown marginal cost. Housebound for two weeks after surgery with a catheter to keep me company, I wander along my window fenced boundary, watch through the shades, wonder whether a cancer speck escaped. In the tall grass of the lower pasture, I see a wild turkey hen with her eight chicks following along. She must count them repeatedly as she nears the road. My barefoot roaming around the carpeted floor reveals flaws. I hear creaks beneath my feet, low places in the subfloor. I retrace steps to assure myself that all is stable, no soft spots. It's an older house and will bear watching. debris from a buried road. How do you feel? Strong. I'm riding, fixing fences. Pieces of asphalt and layers of gravel hide under the grass. The ground resists our shovels. Your color is good. Yes, everything seems okay. We probe what's near the surface. Guess how deep the rubble goes. So you're doing well? I'm fine. But wonder what's inside. Finally, new trees form two neat rows, bare branches with the hope of green. Scar redemption. The surgeon made a six inch cut from my navel downward, a move, removed an organ peppered with cancer. Before the surgery, I took a picture of my abdomen. This is what it looked like when I had all my parts. Over weeks and months, I found myself fingering the healing incision a tingling reminder of the gash where hands entered. I have wondered when the scar in its sensation would go away. It was red and stitched, visibly and invisibly. Later, it felt like braided cord. Then upper portions flattened, smoothed out, while lower parts remained raised and hard. A year passed. I think it will not change much more. Now I realize I don't want it to disappear. I want to touch my scar, be reminded of what's gone, have feelings wash over me. leave trail. The weathered gray wood has carved letters, sits in the brush 10 feet to my right. It surprises me. I have ridden here scores of times, never saw it before. I think about the sign's warning, stay on the marked track with its smooth, hard-packed 
tan dirt, fine white chat. As the mare walks along, I look far downhill at large boulders that had rolled to the bottom of a wooded ravine, at the brown snarl of muddy roots where a tree lost its grip in the last summer storm. Through the branches, there's a glimpse of a nearby barn, its gambrel metal roof, white painted wood sides. Two deer try to blend in. There's no discernible movement save scurrying squirrels. A pale aroma of smoke wafts from an unseen fire. There's a faint sigh as the wind passes through. Then the path is torn with eroded gullies, pebbles washed away, leaving a bed of sharp rocks. The buckskin stumbles, bruises her feet. Farther along, sticky red clay sucks, slows each step. The way evens out. We return to our starting place. The mare has lost three shoes, walks gingerly when I let her loose. Bequest. I laminate my new Medicare card, a presumptuous salute to my unknown future. But it's also time to update my will. I open a spreadsheet on my screen, insert possible bequests in a neat grid like a business plan. What happens if I die first? If Marion dies first? When both of us die? It almost looks academic till I read it aloud. Between courses, I hold your hand across the restaurant table, feel the familiar smooth skin along your wrist, your arm. I look at your lips, inviting as they were almost 50 years ago, and look into your face, see a time when you were without me. When your father died, I could not abate your pain, palpable shock. Now must not say what I've seen. I let go of your hand and these thoughts turn my gaze to the lemon tart just placed before me. Tuxedo Junction. I fasten my cummerbund before the black tie charity ball. Remember when I wore a jacket and tie to board a plane, go to theater. Now it's the other end of the fashion spectrum, jeans everywhere. Youngsters think Windsor a castle instead of a beautiful knot. This dance calls for prim and proper, so I check my onyx cufflinks, push my feet into patent leather shoes, then clip on my Mickey Mouse bow tie. How to get to Carnegie Hall. It's hard when young to understand the sheet music of life. Bundles of eager, ner eager nerves allow us to compose and play symphonies of passion 
with long rhapsodic movements, opus one and beyond. My aging father told me he would rather listen than perform. He liked music to lull him to sleep, not arouse him by its stirring strains. His libido had become pianissimo. I didn't want to be told that the music fades, that the hormonal themes of youth with their presto tempos and encores would be replaced by a role as a supernumerary. Was it like a pianist foiled by arthritis? Or would the will leave with the skill? Decades later, I am a senior. My concerts are less frequent, but I better understand the internal fugue. The music moves at an adagio tempo. Hormones that once played key instruments now sit idly on the sidelines, sometimes ignoring the conductor's baton. I've found new music to score, arrange, riffs and flourishes to explore. Improvisations replace well-known tunes with different crescendos, longer overtures. And as for all good musicians, it's practice, practice, practice. <laughs> Breaking the surface, bouncing over blue-green water, roaring motor behind us, we laugh and talk through the wind and spray, out to look for whales, black and white orcas 30 miles away, a long distance to go by boat. We hope to see them break the surface to breathe. My children lean into the wind, three in front of me, one by my side, sturdy adults, always my children. How do they move so fast? Each was born over 30 years ago, a long way to here. My hopes for them break the surface to breathe. Three children in front of me, one by my side, drenched, red coveralls, orange boat, looking for orcas. Nothing is black and white, all is color. In between the colors, my baby blanket's blue satin fringe is a pale remainder of 65 years ago. The royal blue tassel from high school graduation has grayed. Marion's white wedding dress is ivory now, almost tan. My eyes change brown, green, blue as they reflect my wife's hip swaying walk. Gray hairs in my son's beard. Grandchildren's flushed faces. Friends now gone who shimmer like a mirage in my mind's eye. The red and gold of sunset just over the hill. did Gene Autry really mean? What did he mean he was back in the saddle again? Where had he been? <laughs> Through my tiny TV window, he was always in the saddle, writing, singing, catching bad guys with his sidekick Smiley. 
Time to saddle up, boys. Let's cross the saddle between the two mountains. We're saddled with something hard, but we'll be in the saddle, in control. So let's mount up and ride. I'm always in the saddle, legs touching flanks, hands on reins, body and mind directing, moving. I sit up, ever straight, eyes forward, feel and listen to this animal life. I ride across the saddle, birth and death rise above on both sides. I think I am passing between, then realize I have come down from one and must climb the other. How do I want to go? I want to be in the saddle, always in the saddle. Take a bow. Thank you all so much. We have a reception next door, and uh, our, our wonderful sponsors are all there with materials. So please come next door and enjoy, and we can talk. Thanks so much for being here.